<laughs> wow, uh, thank you, Afshin, for this uh, very kind introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure. I promised you that I tried to silence it, but I don't know. Um, all right. Um, it's, it's, uh, thank you all for coming on this uh, beautiful day. And uh, it's, it's great to be able to speak here in front of one of my mentors, Afshin. Um, and I, so I want to thank uh, Afshin for this invitation, the Farzane Family Center uh, for Iranian Studies, uh, Alan Levinson uh, and the Schusterman Center. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here today. Uh, so as Afshin said, um, I got my, uh, my doctorate degree uh, from UT Austin down the road here. Um, and I'm especially uh, uh, happy to be on OU campus in the year that UT won both football and basketball games. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, just to warm up, uh, let me start with a question. Um, when, I, when I tell people that I work on uh, the Jews of Iran, um, one of the first responses is, wait, are there Jews in Iran? Um, so you're talking about now or the biblical times? Uh, so I'm talking about now. So let's see um, how many Jews live in Iran today as of 2018. Uh, Iran is a nation of roughly 80 million people. If you think that the answer is A, raise your hand. B, C, D. All right, <laughs> so the answer is C. Uh, <laughs> um, there are about between 20 to 35,000 uh, Jews living in Iran today, and the numbers are very contested. Uh, this is, this will come, will become more apparent uh, during the talk. Um, in summer 2016, I traveled to Paris to conduct the last interviews uh, for this book. I interviewed the, the first president of the Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, Abul Hassan Bani Sadr, and the renowned intellectual uh, Darius Ashuri. Um, when I set to interview uh, Ashuri, uh, he asked me, what's my book going to be about? And I told him that I'm hoping to write the history of uh, Iranian Jews in the 20th century. Um, Ashuri is a shrewd humorist, uh, sarcast sarcastically asked me, what about the other 2,600 years? <laughs> uh, with this question, Ashuri was poking fun at the Iranian Jewish custom to start each, other, each one's personal or family history with the uh, Babylonian exile uh, that brought them to Iran some 2,700 years ago. Um, in a way, it reflects the state of the field of Iranian Jewish history. The tendency of writing uh, this long history as a one linear narrative goes far beyond the, the informal family or community narrative. The field of Iranian Jewish history lacks depth and breadth that do justice to the rich history of these communities. Uh, this was true before the revolution of 1979 and it's even truer today. A few years ago in grad school, when I compiled my reading list for the comprehensive exam, there was one monograph, one book on Jewish history that goes to the 20th century. The book was Habib Levy's um, Comprehensive History of the Jews of Iran. Uh, Habib Levy himself was a prominent figure um, uh, in Iranian Jewish history for sure. Uh, but that book was written in 1961. Um, and in the 21st century, it was still the only monograph that, uh, that came all the way to the 20th century. There is a lot to say about this corpus of Habib Levy, his own history, training, and life. I'm happy to get to it later in the Q&A. But now, shall we ask, can one book of three volumes in the Persian original uh, discuss 2,700 years in a nuanced and sophisticated way? Um, after 1979, with the relocation of the majority of Iranian Jews to the US, we see that the way Iranian Jews talked about their experience, their history, the way that they wrote their history has changed drastically. Iranian Jews now had to position themselves not just in relation to, uh, to the US majority society, but also vis-a-vis -vis the dominant, uh, mostly Ashkenazi American Jewish community. Um, 
we see how the language to describe their experiences in their previous homeland has changed. They borrow terms from the vocabulary that Ashkenazi American Jews used to describe their histories back in Europe. Events of unrest became pogroms, a term that was never used by Iranian Jews back in the day, or in Persian for that matter. And the Mahale, the Jewish neighborhood, turned into a ghetto. Both examples are used when speaking English and never when speaking about it in Persian. And I want to show you, uh, so this is a photo from the 1961 edition of Habib Levi's book. And we see Habib Levi at the entrance to the, uh, to the Mahale, to the, get, to the uh, Jewish neighborhood. And in Persian it says, Yeki az Mahale uh, Yaud Tehran, which is one of the entrances to the Jewish neighborhood in Tehran. Uh, and the same photo from the 1999 English translation of the book, uh, and it says um, an entrance to the Tehran ghetto. The usage of ghetto, ah, by the way, uh, this is from a few days ago. It appeared on an Israeli news outlet, pretty mainstream uh, outlet. Uh, it's called Channel 7, uh, and it's a story on uh, a few uh, Torah scrolls that disappeared from one of the synagogues in the Mahale. And the, and the title that was given, who stole the Torah scrolls from Tehran's Jewish ghetto? So you see that there is this usage of ghetto as a, as a way to describe the Jewish neighborhood of Tehran. And the usage of ghetto is not just borrowing a neutral term from different language. Using ghetto in a Jewish context after 1945 creates a world of images that do not necessarily reflect correctly or contextualize Jewish existence in Iran. Just to take uh, from a close enough example to show the difference, Kharat al-Yahud in Cairo remained Kharat al-Yahud uh, in the Jewish writing and writing on Jews in Cairo. Otherwise, it's translated as the Jewish quarter, a perfectly neutral term. It tells us something about, much broader about our ability to think about Jewish history in non-Western societies in general, but also about Iran specifically. The narrative as it goes is that Iranian Jews saw themselves as Iranian, they stayed out of politics, they celebrated their Persian heritage, uh, for example, they celebrate the Nuruz, they celebrate Iranian holidays, they celebrate Suleiman Chaim as the uh, author of the uh, comprehensive dictionary. Um, they suffered from hatred and discrimination that stopped for a while during the Pahlavi uh, period. Um, the community, um, The community overall was very Zionist, uh, and the alliance between Israel and, and the Pahlavi government uh, also supports that notion. Uh, and that history ended with the 1979 revolution. Uh, by the way, it ended with a Zionist redemption. Such narrative prevents us from seeing the immense diversity of the Iranian Jewish community and the many voices that existed in that community throughout the years. The pushback usually comes when talking about political activism, when talking about involvement in the Communist Party in a way that we don't see in cases like Iraq or Egypt, for example. It prevents us from investigating the nature of Iranian communism, of Middle Eastern communism, or even to analyze what the term Iranian Zionism meant. We already know that Jews were a prominent part of Communist parties in other Middle Eastern countries, like Iraq, Egypt, Morocco, and others. We know that until 1948, Jews were pretty assimilated in their respective Middle Eastern societies. And no one would make such uh, one-dimensional assertions regarding Jews in other Middle Eastern countries. So why do we see it here? There's a very good visual explanation of that histori historiographical mold. Uh, this is Mary Gall's work. Uh, it's called Nine out, Nine out of 400, The West and the Rest. Uh, Meir Gal uh, is a visual artist. Uh, he published this work in 1999. Um, and this is an Israeli history high school textbook. book. Textbook. Um, and 400 pages, nine pages talk about the Middle East. Not about Middle East Jews, not about Middle Eastern cultures, just about the Middle East. So this work shows us how little we care to know about the Middle East. And that being part of much larger issue in the Israeli society, 50% of which is of Middle Eastern background. Then 
I want to see in real numbers how come we have such a shallow understanding of the Jewish Iranian experience. And that's what I found. So if you don't know, this is a uh, wall cat. Anyone knows what it is? Yeah? All right. So despite it being a cat, it's still the man's best friend. Uh, <laughs> um, so this is a catalog that uh, gives us data from universities all over the world. Libraries, not universities. Libraries all over the world. Um, and, you know, I searched in the uh, search line, Jews, Iran, history, 20th century. We got 31 returns. 31 out of which there is one book, the Habib Levy book, and then few uh, family albums, VHS on videos, uh, master and, dissert and PhD dissertations, uh, Judeo-Persian literature, not, not any historical uh, analysis of this existence. And then I went to search Jews, Iran, history, 19th century. We got 10 results. Actually, two of them are really good books. One is Daniel Tzadik book, and the other is David Yerushalmi's book, uh, both very important. But 10 books deal with Iran, Jews in the 19th century. I made it as broad as possible. Iran, Jews, Iran, history. Got 390 results. All right. Then just to see what's the case with other countries. Jews, Egypt, history, 20th century. 105 results. Not much better, but still three times more than what we have in Iran. Uh, Jews, Iraq, history, 20th century, 122 results. Jews, United States, history. 20th century, 1,503. Jews, China history, 20th century, 154. I didn't know that there are Jews in China. <laughs> and of course, Jews, Germany history, 20th century, 2,794 results. Um, so with such a thin body of scholarship, there's nothing to be surprised at uh, that superficial understanding. Now, I want to provide um, a quick overview of history of Zionism in Iran. Zionism first came to the fore in Europe as a national movement of European Jews. In a way, this was reaction to European enlightenment and nationalism. Uh, we see the conversation in the Jewish communities regarding Zionism in the 1890s onward, and we see a movement that offered Jews decent, decent ex existence in a place that wouldn't reject them as Europe did, or even true to say, Eastern Europe. There were many paradoxes in Zionist thought that because of our short time I cannot cover, but one of the biggest among them was that the great promise of Zionism was to allow Jews to become fully European when they migrate out of Europe. Um, then we can talk about uh, Herzl internalizing anti-Semitism uh, and anti-Semitic stereotypes, and my favorite of all is uh, we don't believe in God, but he promised us this land. Uh, <laughs> um, at this point, no leader of the nascent Zionist movement even considered Oriental Jews as part of the future Israeli or Zionist society. The Oriental Jews themselves, having had a very different uh, experience in the 19th and 20th century, uh, did not articulate a clear response to the political development in Europe. Moreover, the Jews of the Middle East had not undergone the process of secularization that was essential to the Zionist paradigm and maintained the religious perception of Eretz Israel, Ottoman, mandatory Palestine as the Holy Land. Jews from the Middle East uh, and Iran immigrated in small numbers to Palestine throughout the ages. Uh, but we have to remember that the region was part of the Ottoman Empire, so travels were indeed very, very common, um, especially for pilgrimage and the economy that facilitated it. The message of political Zionism first struck a chord with uh, Jewish Iranians in 1917, following the Balfour Declaration that came uh, at, the, at the same time as the first disillusion Iranian Jews experienced with the outcome of the Constitutional Revolution. All of a sudden, the promise of relocating to place of their own sounded rather tempting. Iranian Jews established Zionist associations to teach Hebrew and to handle the preparation for a mass exodus. However, shortly after, in 1925, 
with the ascendance of Reza Pahlavi as the new Shah, who overthrew the Qajar dynasty, the new national project and the vision of a new Iranian society with almost diminished role of religion and emphasis on ethnic identity made the Jews shelf their plans for relocation. Reza Shah removed all the laws that bar Jews and other minorities from living in certain areas, engage in some occupations and join the army, for example. Jews have now become nominally part of the Iranian society. Um, Zionism remained a more clandestine underground operation. Zionist organizations could operate openly in some fields and then uh, band altogether. Sympathies to Zionism and different interpretations to Zionism started to split the community in the 1930s. Shmuel Chaim, the Jewish representative to the Majlis, to the uh, Iranian parliament, um, had a harsh disagreement with another Jewish dignitary, uh, Lokman Nahorai. Uh, while Nahorai espoused the interpretation and perhaps the practice that Jews should join um, um, full force the Zionist international organizations, uh, Chaim believed that Zionism is overall a positive development, but Iranian Jews should not uh, forfeit their status or rights, or should, uh, they should fight for their rights in, uh, in Iran and not to, uh, not to forfeit it for any messianic dream. Chaim published a newspaper called The Chaim Life, in which he preached for integration efforts for the Jews, participation in political life, and developing national consciousness. Um, Chaim was actually executed by Reza Shah for mostly false accusation of being complicit in an attempt to assassinate him. In any case, following this incident, any non-Iranian organized movement was banned from operating in Iran. World War II changed things around once again. In 1941, the Allied armies invaded and occupied Iran and forced Reza Shah to abrogate in favor of his son, Muhammad Reza who opened this, the political sphere to any and every political movement, including Zionism. For the first time, Zionist organizations based in mandatory Palestine opened headquarters in Tehran and other Iranian cities to care for the needs of Jewish-Polish refugees that had arrived in Iran, but that's part of another story. In any case, after seeing the Polish refugees that fled Europe, first the Nazis and then Stalin Soviet Union, Iranian Jews went through a couple of stages. First, the leadership recognized the need to help their brethren over in Europe to escape the Nazis first and then to help them establish a national home. This obviously made the case for Zionism in Iran and more and more Iranians connected to the message of Jewish redemption out of Zionism. Another thing that happened among Jews is that just like non-Jewish Iranians, they found political home in the newly formed Communist Party, the Tudu Party. They supported and joined it for many reasons. Communist ideology was not one of the main reasons. The main reason was that to the being uh, the fiercest opposition to fascist forces in Iran. Their struggle for an egalitarian society, something that resonated with Iranian Jews that were still, broadly speaking, uh, part of the lower classes. One interviewee for this research was born in Tehran in the, in the early 1930s and now he's residing in North America. Uh, at age 16, he joined the Tudeh party and remained at an active member for more than three decades. His political ac activity landed him in, in Qasr, the Shah's prison, a half dozen times before he left Iran. He told me, and I quote, I knew nothing about Marx or Marxism when I joined the Tudeh. I joined because this was the only place that they didn't call me Juhud, which is a derogatory term for, uh, for Jews. I learned Marxism in prison shortly after I joined the party. So his communist indoctrination took place in the prison, not before he joined the party. On top of that, Jews published communist leaning newspapers, um, and some Jews were among the top ranks of the party. So, um, for example, they published uh, newspapers. Uh, one is Nissan, the other is Bene Adam. Uh, these were uh, semi-official to the newspapers and uh, their readership was, went far beyond the, uh, the community, the Jewish community. And in times that the official to the newspapers were banned, 
uh, this was the mouthpiece of the party leadership. So um, we see that they tried to connect uh, the stories from the different communities, the Jewish communities in Iran and, uh, and the cities and um, the Jewish world. So for example, uh, here we see uh, a classroom in Romania and they tell about the, the socialist utopia and how Jews flourish in, in communist Romania, <laughs> uh, which was <laughs> hardly true, but <laughs> um, anyway. Um, now we have to remember that mainstream Zionism was a socialist movement. Uh, the socialist elements of the movement were extremely dominant and extremely socialist. At around the same time of the 1940s, they established the kibbutzim in future Israel. And the kibbutzim were perhaps one of the biggest communist experiments in history. At that point, one could easily feel sympathies for the Zionist project while at the same time being affiliated with the Iranian Communist Party and fighting alongside the Iranian national movement against the Soviets in the north and the British in the south. Indeed, multi hyphenated identity, such as Iranian nationalist, communist, Zionist, was not a rare sight. After the establishment of Israel in 1948, the Zionist movement could no longer be considered a non-state actor. Having discovered the terrible loss of six million Jews in the Holocaust, six millions that would have been the human reservoir for Israel, Israel had to find another source to make up for that loss. Again, what it, while it was not their intention in the first place, in 1948, David Ben-Gurion, Israel's prime minister, ordered to find them among the Mizrahi Jews. In the Muslim Middle East, from Morocco to Iraq, for Morocco to Iran, from Yemen to Turkey, there were about 950,000 Jews. The Israeli goals were to make them immigrate en masse. It worked in some, some of the communities for several reasons, but we see that the Yemenite community live in Yemen, Jews in Syria, Lebanon, and Libya left almost completely by 1948-9, Iraq by 1951, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, and Egypt by 1956. But in Iran, where Zionists could operate almost completely openly, and the population was pretty sympathetic to Zionism. The Jews did not consider political Zionism to be their ideal solution. Rather, they were going through a rapid process of urbanization, of becoming an integral part of their homeland society. And the global politics helped them, ironically, make these multi-layered and nuanced identities and loyalties. In the early 1950s, Habib Levy, the same Habib Levy that wrote the book, uh, wrote a report for the Jewish agency in Jerusalem lamenting the loss of entire generation that preferred leftist Iranian organizations over Zionist ones. To that mix, we can add socialist Zionist political parties, especially from the spectrum of the kibbutzi movement that sent emissaries to Iran, and they found mutual ground themselves with Iran socialist and communist. Uh, so we see uh, um, emissaries from uh, political parties on the Zionist left that went to Iran to, uh, to provide some Zionist education, and they themselves encouraged the younger generation to participate in the two day act activities and to go to the two day clubs. Um, another, another thing uh, is, yeah, huh. um, Jalal Ahmad, for example, the, one of the most important Iranian intellectuals of the 20th century. Um, in 1963, he visited Israel and stayed 10 days in, uh, in Israel and uh, he stayed in the kibbutz, Ayel Tashachar, um, and um, he wrote a travelogue that was very uh, widely read on how the kibbutzim, how Israel was able to, uh, to use uh, religious uh, traditions and socialism to become a bridge between East and West. It's a very beautiful and recommended reading. Um, but this is, I found it in the kibbutz uh, guest book. Uh, and uh, Jalal Ahmad and his wife, Siminda Neshvar, also a very famous, very important novelist, they wrote, regardless of the hospitality, I saw here people I've never expected to meet, learned people, understanding and open-minded. In a sense, they are implementing plateau. Honestly speaking, I always identified Israel with the kibbutz and now I understand why. And his wife, Siminda Neshvar, wrote, as I see it, the kibbutz is the answer to the problems of all the countries, including our own. So there were these many layers of 
relationship between uh, the Israeli government and the Iranian government, the Israeli opposition and the Iranian opposition. And uh, in those times, we see uh, Zionist and Israeli involvement in Jewish life in Iran. Zionist clubs and youth movements were active. However, Iranian Jews did not engage Zionism as Israeli officials had hoped. Indeed, Zionism had become more complex than in 1917. The 25,000 Iranian Jews that had immigrated to Israel uh, between 1948 and 1951 were the poorest and the neediest of the Iranian Jewish communities. But there were myriad stories at the time of Jews who had immigrated and returned or immigrated and wanted to return. And the important thing was that Iranian Jews overall had a sober idea of what was waiting for them on the other side of the story, unlike many other Middle Eastern Jews. Um, so, for example, there were many weekly flights of Elal between Tehran and Tel Aviv. Um, there were very strong relations between the, the two countries, the military establishments. Um, a telling example is given in Stanley Abramowitz's uh, report in 19, 1951. So Stanley Abramowitz was uh, a JDC, the Jewish Distribution Committee, um, director in Iran, and he described one instance of Jews from Nehevand, and I quote, the letters that come from Israel dampen all spirits. The Iranian Jew is not the Halutzik pioneer type. The ordeals of present day life in Israel have left him discouraged, longing to return to his damp, dark ghetto room, for he has been used to that room and even liked it. Food is available in Iran, and though he earned little, he lived in an environment which was not strange to him. The language, the people, the life was familiar. Israel is not. As a Persian, he is looked down upon. The letters that come back from, uh, to Iran complain about shortage of food. Nehvand received a letter and a, th and a Torah scroll from their brethren in Israel. The Nehvand Jews in Israel signed their names on this piece of scroll and in the accompanying letter they wrote that they took an oath by the Torah from which they sent a piece that their brethren in Nehvand will not come to Israel now anyway, not until they inform them that the time is more suitable. And Nehvand is a God-forsaken place in the mountains of Loristan, cut off from the outside world. Yet the lunchlight in Israel advised them, adjured them to remain in Nehvand. Another family was advised not to leave for Israel until, until their son Joseph is married. Joseph is one year old. Another interesting and uh, nuanced uh, interpretation comes from Elias Esakyan. Elias Esakyan was a teacher and uh, principal of Alian schools in Iran for over 25 years. He wrote in his memoir, Iran has been my homeland, my vatan, and Jerusalem has been the source of my belief in God and my kribleh. So Qibla is the direction uh, to which Muslims turn their prayers. Um, so we see how Eshakyan used the, uh, the Islamic term for direction of prayer when he talked about Jerusalem and Zion. Um, this quotation suggests yet again that many Iranian Jews had different interpretations of Zionism than the one of the Jewish agency and Israel advanced. Eshakyan was a role model for many Iranians, and it is clear that his national identity of Iranian did not interfere with his religious identity as a Jew. He proudly projected this combined identity throughout his career, which may have inspired and encouraged many of his students. The Jews, uh, so, I mean, we see that for him, Zionism meant something beyond political Zionism. It was more spiritual. Now, during the revolution, um, the Jewish community was also very active on both sides, by the way, of the, the loyal, uh, those that were loyal to the Shah and those that were part of the revolutionary uh, movements. Uh, in fact, in March 1978, uh, nine months before the Shah left Iran, 
uh, a revolutionary group won the elections uh, to the Tehran Jewish community leadership. Uh, and these were uh, people that were active, uh, politically active, since their days as students in, in Tehran. Um, they were to the activists, they were in prison for their political activism, and in prison they met uh, the leaders of the Islamic Revolution, of what would become the Islamic Revolution. And they were very much uh, sympathetic to the cause. They felt integrated and they felt part of the Iranian society. So it informed their political activity during the revolution. And um, so they published revolutionary newspapers, Tammuz, for example, in which they talked about uh, the why they tried to make the case why Jews should force uh, should join the, the 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 revolutionary forces and what would be the character of the uh, of post-revolutionary Iran and um, what kind of republic we'll have um, and this is for example a photo from September 1978 one of the biggest demonstrations in the history of the revolution uh, and there were 12,000 Jews in the, in the streets that day. 12,000 in Tehran out of 40,000 that lived in Tehran at the time. So it, it's really a telling number. Um, and also, um, I won't tell a, a, a sh an anecdote from that time of, of the revolution. Um, one more story is that the Jewish hospital, um, that during the demonstrations, there were five hospitals in Tehran, four state hospitals and one Jewish private hospital. During the demonstrations, the Shah sent the army to, to deal with the protesters. And when protesters, unarmed protesters, meet tanks and uh, firearms, it usually ends not too well for the protesters. Uh, in many cases, uh, there were tens and hundreds of uh, protesters that were injured uh, in each demonstration. And um, when they came to the state hospitals to take to get treatment, uh, they were usually met uh, by the Savak, the secret service of the Shah, that took care of them in different ways than they, they, they expected. Uh, and the Jewish hospital, uh, sent, collaborated with one of the leaders of the revolution, Said Ayatollah Talakani, eh, Ayatollah Mahmoud Talakani, um, and they sent ambulances to the streets to pick up protesters and bring them to the Jewish hospitals. That because of the, the way that the Shah uh, protected the rights of the Jews, the secret service could not enter the, the Jewish hospital. So they had very uh, important role in saving lives. Um, this is a photo of the, uh, of the hospital staff, nurses, uh, after the revolution. Um, and you see that on the, on the sign at the entrance, it says, uh, it's the biblical verse, the love your neighbor as thyself. Um, and they said this is the philosophy of the hospital, right? It's not about supporting the revolution or opposing the revolution. It's about love your neighbor. And one more story from the, uh, from the time of the revolution. Uh, and this was two months after the revolution, April 1979, uh, exactly 20 years ago. It was Passover. And the Iranian television decided to host a program on Passover to talk about the values of Passover, of redemption of going from dictatorship to liberation. They talked about um, Khomeini as Pharaoh and uh, Khomeini as Moses <laughs> and the Shah as Pharaoh. And, um, and they hosted in the studio uh, two Jewish um, leaders. One of them was uh, a rabbi of Tehran and the other was Aziz Daneshrad. Uh, a Jewish uh, activist who was also in the uh, Constitution uh, Drafting Committee. So he was very prominent uh, leader in the Jewish community. And they talked about all the values of Passover and the story of Passover. And then just before the end of the show, the host dropped a bomb. And 
he asked, is it true that all the Jews are Zionists? And both guests were taken aback. Uh, to say something like that in 1979 on national television is very charged. And um, then the rabbi was the first to respond. And he said, what is Zion, do you know? Zion is the biblical name of Jerusalem. If loving Zion makes me a Zionist, then yes, I'm Zionist and all the Jews are Zionists. You're Muslim, right? You pray to Mecca, right? You love Mecca. Does it make you a Saudi? Now, to those who don't know, if there is one country in the region that Iran likes less than Israel, it's Saudi Arabia. <laughs> and to suggest that the loyalty that, um, that the loyalty is given to Saudi over Iran just because Mecca is there is just unimaginable. But we see again this understanding of Zion as a religious, as a spiritual place, as a spiritual con concept. Um, and I, I, I think that this is what we have to think about when we talk about Zionism in, in places that we don't fully, um, Zionism is not one monolithic thing that uh, was projected, as projected by uh, or as we understand today. Zionism meant many things in many places. Now, with the delicate situation between Israel and Iran since 1979, the Jews of Iran were even more courageous to remain true to their own interpretation of Zionism and Judaism. Even after the revolution, Iranian Jews emigrated to the US and much fewer to Israel. And about 25 to 30% of, of the community chose to stay in Iran they still recognize the right of Israel to exist and are interested in the going-ons in Israel. They visit Israel, and many of them have relatives there. Even when speaking in public, in the press, or in the parliament, they say that the most deplorable thing about Israel is not its existence, but its refusal to become part of the Middle East, to make peace with its Arab neighbors and other issues concerning the ethnic tensions in Israel. I would like to end this talk with a short excerpt from one of my favorite memoirs uh, on the Jewish-Iranian experience in the 1970s. It's a memoir by Roya Hakakian, Journey from the Land of No, uh, where she tells about the Passover Seder night in her family house in Tehran, 1977. I quote, naturally, it caused an uproar at the Seder when father asked Uncle Ardi to read the Halachma. Everyone burst into laughter before he even began. He obeyed and read, but not without a touch of subversion, a bit of mischief. This is the bread of affliction, some affliction, that our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt. This year we are slaves. May this slavery never end. This year here and next year at home in Israel. Pardon me for not packing. The family dreamed of the land of milk and honey, but wanted to wake up in Tehran. After reciting the al Uncle Ardi asked, So, Hakakian, are your bags packed or the flight to Jerusalem postponed for another year? Father smiled and waved him away, assuming his question had been meant in jest. But Uncle Ardi, without the slightest hint of humor, pressed on, Really, Hakakian, why say it? Why not leave it and love thy neighbor like thyself and call off the rest? Thank you very much.